Well, here we are again, boys. I've been collecting different video game collector's editions for a long time, which in hindsight kind of makes it hard to move to another country. Guess, uh, other things are making that kind of hard also, so... But among my collection, I have a few favorites, and Fallout New Vegas is realistically probably at the top. The game made its debut two short years after Fallout 3, and I can't tell you the amount of excitement that I had for it. For me, the game had an immensely different feeling to it than Fallout 3, yet felt the same in a lot of ways. Where Fallout 3 had Washington DC, and a lot of ruined city-type areas, New Vegas had the desert, the casinos, the people. My god, the people. Bethesda took that momentum that they had going for them with Fallout 3, and in one of the best decisions they've ever made, pitched the game over to the franchise's original creators, Obsidian, who worked their asses off to get the game out in 18 short months. I played New Vegas to hell and back so hard when it came out that I actually burnt out on it. I know that's probably blasphemy to some people considering that, oh, one or two of you have been trying to get a video out of me on the game for a while. But it's true, I've only really touched the game one or two other times beyond that initial surge of playing it. And I'll tell you guys right now, I only played one of the DLCs also. So considering all of that, I had to wonder, was Fallout New Vegas as good as I remember? But first things first, mods. As always, there's either criticism of me using mods because it's not true to the original game, or there's criticism of me not using any mods in a Bethesda game on PC. My stance will always be that I do not critique the game's graphics, so I installed some texture mods and left the characters as they are. I'll always be the first to say that the visuals of an older game won't look nearly as good as they used to, so there's no point in evaluating them. I actually remove a lot of them later. <laughs> Anyways, New Vegas starts with the most powerful opening sequence I've ever seen in a Bethesda game. It's theatrical, it's compelling, but most importantly, it's concise and informational. Games like Fallout 3 and 4 tell you where you are, who the people are in front of you, what you're supposed to do. New Vegas tells you who the major factions are. It introduces the New California Republic, a group which represents democracy and standing for the people while finding common ground between them. It brings up Caesar's Legion, a totalitarian group of slaves and slavers who seek to dominate and rule over the wasteland through military doctrine. It mentions the New Vegas Strip and the mysterious entity known as Mr. House, who runs the Strip and lords over its citizens. And the game tells you what's happened to you and what your role was before you got shot in the head. It takes that moment of expectancy, that moment of, uh, well, who's gonna swoop in and save my character, and flips it on its head. Or puts a bullet in it, rather. Truth is, the game was rigged from the start. This is a fantastic introduction as the game then transitions into character creation when you wake up in a dusty clinic after being tended to after your near fatal encounter. From here, it's pretty much Fallout as you know it. You change your appearance, you take a look at your special skills, you pick out your tag skills, and traits are reintroduced into the series. The skills from 3 to New Vegas have changed ever so slightly, and I would say for the better, honestly. Firstly, the big guns and small guns have been consolidated under the umbrella of a skill simply named guns, which I think is a less tedious way to go about your weapon focus. And secondly, the outdoorsman skill from the older entries in the franchise makes its way back into the series, kind of, in the form of survival. While it isn't the greatest perk in the world for a casual player, it's a great addition for those who want to try their hand at a hardcore mode. Then we've got traits. Traits are those age-old trade-off perks which give you a negative effect in exchange for a positive one. Much of the time, these types of things are seen in the top-down RPG adventure genre, so it's kind of cool to see them adapted into a first-person entry of the Fallout franchise. I do miss Bloody Mess as one of the traits. It still shows up as a perk later, but at least Wild Wasteland still exists. After going through a few psychological questions that don't really matter at all, you shore up your character and Doc Mitchell sends you on your way, pointing you in the direction of the robot which found your body and Sunny Smiles, who hangs out at the saloon and derives her name from being the same color as the sun. Old Easy Pete here fills you in a little more about the NCR and the Legion, stating that the big issue with the NCR is that they try to make people a part of them no matter what, and that if your small town has something valuable, it's gonna be integrated. Democracy! The Legion, on the other hand, are described pretty much as mentioned before. You don't want to be caught by them, basically. Pete also mentions the Battle of Hoover Dam, a fight that took place when the Legion moved in on the dam. Hoover Dam is an invaluable resource that more or less makes whoever controls it own the entirety of New Vegas as well. So after this, it's a bit of tutorial-type stuff that's relatively standard, 
followed by a run-in with the Powder Gangers. These fellows are threatening this small town for harboring someone who escaped from them after they themselves broke out of the NCR prison. The whole quest is a pretty simple introduction to the karma and reputation systems, of which the rep system has a much bigger impact. So if we think about it this way, New Vegas's karma system is the light version of Fallout 3's. But the rep system is a much more comprehensive and elaborate one, which is expressed through fame and infamy. Every major town and faction and quite a few minor ones regard your character differently depending on how famous or infamous you are to them. In this case, the town of Good Springs would consider me more famous if I helped them out of this jam, thus affecting the town's NPC attitude towards me and netting me better prices at the town's shops. The opposite here would net me fame among the Powder Gangers, and uh, not much else. Free dynamite? And I guess they won't eventually attack me randomly like they will if I help out Good Burger and continue to piss them off. But the main takeaway here is that the reputation system is really goddamn neat. There are 16 possible reputations which you can accrue with each faction, and it really gives New Vegas a great flavor that other Bethesda-owned fallouts lack. Say your fame is really high with a faction, and you decide to do something particularly awful to one of the faction's members. A lot of the times, if your fame is high enough, the hit to your reputation won't warrant instant hatred. And the faction will wind up seeing you as a pretty stand-up guy who occasionally makes a poor decision. Or if it really is the worst thing that you can do, maybe your reputation will dip into the likes of Wild Child, someone who's the embodiment of chaos and people have no idea what to make of you or what you'll do next. But there's even more to it than that, actually. Say you're vilified among the NCR, but you have an NCR uniform. You can actually disguise yourself as a random NCR soldier and have a decent standing in their ranks. That said, there are several NPC types which might be able to see through the disguise as well. It's a very cool system. So all of that being said, I sided with the good guys because, yeah. I know this seems like such a silly and minor quest to get into detail on, but it really does set up the game more than I thought it would. So as soon as you decide to help out, you also go to recruit Sunny. She immediately says yes, but also tells you that there are several other citizens of Good Springs that might be coerced into pitching in. This is where the beauty of this otherwise insignificant quest comes in. All of this is totally optional. You can steamroll through and ignore it and probably be okay to take on the Powder Gangers. But if you do choose to visit each of these people, most of them require a specialized speech check. More specifically, one speech check to convince Judy, one explosives check for Dynamite from Easy Pete, and one barter check from the general goods owner. I'll admit, barter is infinitely more useful already in New Vegas than the previous game, and I'm actually considering dumping points into it. I never do. Anyways, the whole thing goes down with no issue, and it's time to take flight from Good Springs. The next step to getting this thing rolling is heading over to Prim and hopefully finding the whereabouts of the people that put you out of commission temporarily. Apparently this whole town's gone to hell with escaped prison convicts, but the main bulk of Prim is holed up in this old casino. It's here where you're informed that you weren't initially going to be the courier to deliver a particular casino chip, but once the other courier saw that your name was on the list, he declined the job, saying to give it to you instead. You were one of six couriers, all of which were delivering various bits of gaming paraphernalia such as dice and chess pieces. In order to find out more info, you gotta rescue Deputy Beagle from captivity across the way. He tells you that the guy that you're looking for was headed to Novak and mentions that they could use a new sheriff to protect the people in Prim. This gives you the option of asking the NCR, or a former sheriff who turned powder ganger who was at the NCR correctional facility. I decided to hoof it over to the prison because it was the closer option after the close-by NCR decided that they need reinforcements before they'd help. Turns out being shunned by the Powder Gangers doesn't necessarily mean that they'll shoot on sight, which is cool. What isn't cool is this absolute assload of lag that I started to take on when I loaded this area. Like, holy shit. I looked it up and yeah, a lot of people had issues with this area and a few others. So far, New Vegas is great, but my god. You remember that 18-month development cycle? Well, the 11 game crashes, the sound suddenly cutting out after a VATS usage, and now this horrendous lag which I've been put through so far in the first hour or so of the game are really a testament to that. Which I hate to see not only because of the technical issues, but because knowing what I know now, Bethesda more or less outsourced this game to Obsidian and told them that the deadline was the end of 2010 no matter what, because Skyrim was coming up after that. Thankfully, after reloading the game, I was able to talk to the guy out front who told me exactly who the Powder Gangers are, who their leader is, why they're here, what he did to get here, and what he wanted to be when he grew up. 
I'm being facetious with that last bit because I honestly don't understand why someone who's involved with a bunch of hostile convicts would tell me all of this so openly. I get that it's information, but this kind of seems like one of those reputation speech checks or uh, a persuasion moment in general. I find it funny that this guy tells me all of them in a relatively polite tone. It's, uh, west of here, I think. Back in California. And then he goes, Oh, uh, <coughs> hundred caps to get in, kid. Now get lost. Of course, I opted to pick his pocket and just mosey on in. The former sheriff was someone who got put into this prison for bypassing due process a few too many times, which sounds like a great qualification for running things out here. What could go wrong? What sucks is that I got played like a fiddle here, and my quest to not go to the further location gets thwarted when I need to go there anyway for the pardon. And then on top of that, I need a speech check of 30 or a barter check of 20 to accomplish either of the two options here, so I'm kind of SOL for now. Oh well, to be continued and all that. Alright. So onward to Novak, which requires passage through Nipton. Nipton's, uh, a strange place. Smell that air! Couldn't you just drink it like booze? <laughs> I won the motherfucking lottery! <laughs> oh, oh my god, smell that air! <laughs> Bye. I'm sure I'll figure out whatever the hell that's about eventually. So Novak is a town named, I presume, after this no vacancy sign, which I thought was pretty clever. Also T-Rex. You quickly learn that the sniper who watches over the town knows who the guy who shot you is. And he offers to help you out with tracking him down if you go to eliminate some of the ghouls up the road at the rocket testing facility. This leads to another quest where you're led to believe that you're just clearing out some ferals, but it winds up being a brotherhood of ghouls with all of their faculties in check who have holed up in the facility. And Chris, who talks like a ghoul. God, but are you ugly. Get upstairs and talk to Jason before I throw up just from looking at you. This quest is fantastic, which is honestly something I wasn't expecting in a vanilla side quest. The devs tip you off with a nightkin body containing a single stealth boy, which is nice foreshadowing. Basically, these ghouls want to launch themselves into, uh... Space, I guess? With a rocket but a group of invisible nightkin have stopped them from doing so. The head ghoul in charge has you blow out these so-called demons so that they can move on to blowing themselves out into the sky. Also, Chris thinks he's a ghoul. Stalking the nightkin is surprisingly tense, and I'd be more leery of running and gunning instead of sneaking and peeking. My only complaint is this godforsaken layout of an underground bunker, but that's minor compared to the goods of this quest. After dealing with the roving gang of Marvel villain rejects, you're sought after for one more quest. Get this big-ass cartoon rocket working. For this, you'll need some crazy radioactive isotope and a set of custom rocket controls. I just like that my guy asks, so is this thing uh, ground to orbit or ground to ground? And the Lord of Glow is like, don't worry about that, you silly bitch. What matters is that it's a goddamn rocket. Hell yeah, dude. The isotope is pretty straightforward, and so are the controls, technically. But this old bat charges a steep 500 caps for them unless you know how to talk, which I do not yet. Fortunately, my character's been featured in a few episodes of Hoarders, so I was able to make some cash off of her. I do wish that Chris here would have said, Okay, so do both of these at once. Because the game having a 50-50 chance of crashing when I load an area is kind of annoying to deal with twice as much. At any rate, the rockets get repaired, all of the ghouls say good morning to each other, and Chris realizes he's a human. The end of this quest is hilarious because these dumb idiots all suit up and you watch as their rockets very obviously spin out in a weird way, likely smashing somewhere close by in the wasteland. I just wish I could have seen them crash, though I think if my science was high enough I could have arranged that. When you return to Novak, Manny tells you that the fellow that you're looking for is named Benny, and that he was last headed to Boulder City. Well, Boulder City's in a bit of a lockdown to a standoff between the NCR and the Great Khans. Fortunately, with the sheer amount of points I've been pumping into speech, the quest is a small bump in the road as I'm able to broker peace between the two factions, at least temporarily. I also learned that the leader here was betrayed by Benny when he initially helped him to take me out. Benny is apparently a chairman at the Topps Casino in the New Vegas Strip, and he used the cons to get the chip from me and attempt to murder me. Fortunately, this whole exchange has gained me pretty good favor with both factions, which is going to be helpful down the line. 
So now it's onward to the ever-present glow that is the New Vegas Strip. It's pretty goddamn cool to see this stark contrast between the dry and dusty desert landscape and this beacon of metropolitan glory basking the desert in its radiance. The contrast to this illuminated infrastructure is Freeside, which is the area surrounding the Strip and a brick-for-brick -brick replication of Cleveland, Ohio, circa 2010. The entire area is packed with less fortunate folks, gang members, and thugs looking to maul anyone who looks like an easy mark. Hungry? Thirsty? Horny? As much as I would like to push on through to the Strip, I actually can't for now. The Securitron guarding the outside requires you to either have a passport or 2,000 caps to gain entry, which I, uh, kind of lack in both departments. With that being said, I thought it was time to focus this video a little more. New Vegas does have different factions in the way that an Elder Scrolls game will have guilds, but they aren't nearly as prevalent. Don't get me wrong, there are plenty of factions to explore, but most of them don't have a large amount of quests like, say, the Dark Brotherhood or the Thieves Guild would. The main four factions of the game all lead you down the same quest lines to different endings, which is really cool. But I'm not going to replay the game from a certain point over and over to investigate them all, so I decided I'm going to side with the NCR when I get to that point. I've completed two runs before this, one for Yes Man and one for Mr. House, and I feel like the NCR is probably going to be the best route for this evaluation. So where does that leave us now? Well, I think I'm going to hit some of the Great Khan's quests while I'm, uh, still on their good side. The first quest has me stumbling upon, uh, an encampment, I guess? It's a very loose definition of an encampment. But the deal is that I can further my favor with the Khan's if I manage to track down some drugs. It's a very cut and dry mission that has me traveling to two separate areas to track them down. The most dangerous part of this quest is actually finding it. My god, if you ever just want to feel like you're made of paper, start a new game of New Vegas and just begin wandering. The giant rad scorpions, death claws, and cazadors are absolutely brutal, and I found myself bitching out and taking advantage of poor AI pathing just to stay alive. Either way, the actual quest is no big deal, and the main cons area is shown to you as part of your reward. So the Great Khans are a nomadic, barbarian-type tribe who value pillaging, raiding, and drug dealing. Their entire culture is built off of the Mongolians of old. And they're not outright hostile, either. They actually tend to keep to themselves when they aren't, uh, uh pillaging. The raiding has actually slowed down substantially for the time being as the NCR came in and drove them out of their former residence via massacring many of their weak, their women, and their children. This has caused their current leader, Papa Khan, to despise the NCR and to accept Caesar's envoy for negotiations. They've been promised tons of land for themselves if they help the Legion dismantle the NCR. The problem is that Caesar has no intention of keeping this promise, as evidenced by his scout's journal. To convince Papa Khan to turn down the offer and side with the NCR instead, I'm to talk to the other leaders of the Khans and help them see the light as well. This spins into another side quest which has me figuring out what happened to the lead drug creator's runner when he went down to the southeast part of the map. Well, turns out that he's cosplaying as Jesus out here at the Legion-owned area. So, to cut to the chase, all of these little quests kind of intertwine with each other and none of them are particularly compelling from a technical standpoint. But from a story perspective, there's a bit more going on. I enjoyed the idea of the Great Khans, their attitudes, how they aren't just complete dickheads because they're quote-unquote bad guys. They're more of a chaotic neutral veering towards evil rather than outright evil, and to me that's an underrated faction quality. Anyways, after doing all of the back and forth, two of these quests wind up pointing you towards the next minor faction, the Followers of the Apocalypse. Located in Freeside, the Followers are a knowledgeable bunch of scholars, doctors, and scientists whose main goal is to help those in need with medicine, knowledge, and agricultural assistance. They're actually the group who taught the Khan stuff like how to read and farm, and how to create medicine, which they use to make drugs. They're a good group of people who have plenty of services to offer the Wasteland, even if it's not always in the Wasteland's best interest. I'll stick a pin in their quests for now as I take this new information back to the cons to hopefully help them find a new purpose with their lives as a faction. This is exactly the kind of symbol the cons could unite behind. Oh, oh cool, yeah, those guys were, uh, historically good people. I want to break here for just a moment to compliment this game even further. So I just ran through an entire minor faction side quests. Were they fun? Eh, not really. But these people, the Great Khans, and by extension the followers of the Apocalypse, they're very... real in a way. 
I can't say I felt this way very much at all when I played Fallout 3. I mean, sure, there was stuff like Tenpenny Tower quests and uh, Tranquility Lane, but these were interesting individuals, interesting areas, interesting quests. And I'm not discrediting them at all, but thinking back on stuff like Megaton and the like, yeah, sure, they were cool towns, and they were interesting to a degree. But I can't think of any group of people that have felt more human and fun to pull the strings of like New Vegas has provided so far. I know I'm rambling here, but I really am impressed. I do wish that the actual quest content for these factions would live up to the rocket fun times that I had earlier, but we'll see how it all pans out. I really can't blame a game this size for having strings of back and forth fetch quests, especially when the payoff tends to be interesting background knowledge and character interactions. Also, this was the part where I disabled a lot of my texture mods because uh, this game has literally crashed 35 times now. While disabling the mods does seem to make it a little more stable, it does still crash, which really sucks. So now it's time to check out the followers a little bit more, which has me talking to this guy at first. He doesn't have any quests for me, but he is pretty fun to talk to. I'm sure Julie Farkas does, though. Lab coat, pointy hair, answers to the name Julie Farkas, strangely enough. The most interesting thing that he fills me in on is the fact that Caesar used to be a follower before moving on to what he does now, which I guess is crucifying people and shit. Julie is the main person to talk to here, and she fills you in on the idea of recruiting two junkies and getting them off drugs to help around the camp, and that the Crimson Caravan or the folks at the Atomic Wrangler can probably help supply the followers with more medical supplies. I know this is just a Bethesda game thing, but when you recognize a voice actor from somewhere else, and then you hear him doing a bunch of other voices for other characters, it really is distracting as hell. I mean, it's less of a complaint and more of an observation, really, but, uh, yeah. I want to mention a few things up front. Prim is important to our trade up from California. We can supply them with all the medics they need. Now, it's not that I don't believe you. Ah, you're such a saint. You're a bastard after my own heart. Hey, do you mind? I'm trying to drink myself to the ground right here. Why stop? I feel great. Okay, carry on. The entirety of the followers' quests are really more beneficial to Freeside, as you fix up the various addicts, broker trading deals between different organizations and the followers, and solve ongoing issues that impede them from expanding their helpful services throughout the wasteland. It's interesting because a few of these objectives don't even show up as quests, but still net you reputation bonuses regardless. One of these quests bleed over into the King's territory. The Kings are a group of, uh, Elvis impersonators, I guess, whose influence is pretty high in Freeside. The King's the bored looking guy by the stage. Can't fucking miss him. I'm the King. What can I do for you? Well, I mean, they don't all talk like that, but they're pretty funny to interact with regardless. The king himself wants you to investigate a bodyguard who's been taking all of the business and repeat business for himself, which has you hiring Liam, uh, or, uh, Oris to escort you from one end of Freeside to the other. The whole thing involves a staged attack and you wind up reporting back to the king so that they can take care of it, which leads you into a more important quest involving NCR troops beating the shit out of squatters in their free time. It turns out that some of the King's men dished out a beating to an NCR envoy first behind the King's back, which has raised tensions to a boiling point. Fortunately, the NCR can be talked down, and the King grants you one favor in exchange for easing this conflict. The favors include joining the King's, forging a passport into the Strip, or 1,000 caps. I'm taking the caps since it seems like the best deal of the three to me. Plus, now I have both enough caps and science to make it onto the strip, so it's about time that we see what New Vegas here has to offer besides non-stop crashing in Freeside. Wow. It's even more beautiful than I imagined. So the first thing that you're immediately directed to is the Lucky 38, and by extension, Mr. House. Victor here has popped up in several places, seemingly following you after he pulled you from your grave. The reason he did all of this was because he had orders from Mr. House. House has use for you as someone who can take out Benny, who House was grooming to be his protege until Benny betrayed him. There's something extremely important about the platinum chip which Benny stole, but House won't tell you until you bring it back. The more in-depth background of House was that he was the CEO of Robco before spending extraordinary amounts of money to somehow keep himself alive later hiring a few different tribes to re-establish and run the strip. After he offers you four times the amount of cash for the chip, he sends you on your way, presumably after Benny. He also hooks you up with the presidential suite and access to the cocktail bar at the Lucky 38. 
The devs did a really good job with the atmosphere of this place. The weird, eerie, electronic music suits the absolute lack of human life in this gigantic empty space suited exclusively to house human life. It just doesn't feel very welcoming despite how nice it looks, which I thought was cool. I would have liked it if there were more things to mess around with like little gambling minigames, maybe a robot bartender to mix custom drinks with some rare ingredients found in the Mojave, something like that. It would have also been kind of cool to have different exclusive foods to find around the presidential suite area, as seeing a pot of squirrel stew is kind of off-putting. But I don't know, maybe that's all just part of it. At any rate, House's thirsting for the platinum chip and my desire for revenge on Benny coincide, so let's get on with it. Well, I guess we'll get on with it after the NCR messenger and this guy peddling easy-to-hide weapons for casinos assault me with information. The NCR guy's message says that the principal wants to see me in his office, and the trench coat does the weapon selling thing. So on to the Topps Casino where I immediately get distracted by Blackjack until they toss me off the tables. Apparently having my decent chunk of luck in this game really helps with Blackjack hands, which is kinda cool. It's also funny seeing the different stages of, Whoa, here's a drink buddy, keep gambling! To, here's a nice meal, keep gambling! to, uh, oh, here's a key to the high roller suite, just keep gambling. And then finally they hit the, uh, alright, fuck off. Anyways, I get to Benny with 10,000 more caps in my pocket who shits his pants at the sight of me. You'd think he would have seen me raising a ruckus at the blackjack table, but, uh, either way, he plays it off cool and tells me to meet him up at the presidential suite for answers and I tell him to lose the bodyguards. It's easy to see how Benny has gotten as far as he has. The guy is a smooth talker and is willing to meet your demands for answers without any bodyguards if you can smooth talk him back. He fills you in on the platinum chip being some kind of data storage, something that will beef up the Securitrons to a point that they can defend the strip against the NCR, the Legion, really any hostile forces. The issue is that he really has no idea what exactly needs to be done. He knows what he wants, but he wants you to be the special agent who pulls it off. And knowing how ruthless he was with shooting you for the chip, he's very likely to betray you down the line if you do his bidding. That said, I decided to Todd Howard him with a lie of my own and get him to believe that I'm on his side. Well, for a moment or two. With the platinum chip in hand, I really only have three or so options. One, give it to Mr. House and start to do his bidding. Two, use it to install Benny's robot as the controller of the strip, overriding Mr. House, or three, just hang on to it. Since I'm going to be siding with the NCR, I'll just hold on to the chip myself and let House believe that I'm working with him. I mean, the guy still gets a pretty big upgrade to security, but it's not like I'm going to be starting a fight directly on the strip. I take my wife everywhere, but somehow she keeps finding her way back. I did it! I know a guy, his motto is love thy neighbor. He lives next to a brothel, oh no! I've been married- Homicides will not be tolerated. After I bust out of the casino, the followers have one more quest for me. To tap into the Lucky 38 systems and plant something that will hopefully give them some insight as to how House has stayed alive for so long. I'm cool with that, so I spin around and head back in only for the entire thing to be a fruitless endeavor. Good quest. Alright, so before moving on to the next feature, there's a couple more strip families to take a look at. The first of the two would be the Omertas who head up the Gamora Casino. After cleaning them out of their caps at Blackjack, I decide to chat up this lady over here. You see, I'm uh, extremely interested in gaining additional experience, uh, and the speech options provided do a really great job at gaining me additional experience. So I have to make sure that tucking her into bed doesn't also give some kind of additional hidden bonus experience and uh, uh, anyways. She opens up to me after she's done opening up to me and tells me that a man named Kachino has been doing horrible things to her in the bedroom, in addition to breaking Omerta's rules constantly. She thinks that he's disappeared her lover, Carlitos, who promised her escape from her life here at Gamora. I know it sounds weird, but this is actually probably some of the finer female voice acting I've heard in these games, which isn't exactly what I expected from this questline. I look pathetic, huh? The great Joanna. And now... 
I don't even know why I'm telling you this. Unfortunately, the quest itself isn't that great. Your entire objective is to go find Carlitos, who is a two-minute walk away, quote-unquote, hiding in a hotel. I do admit the idea of repurposing a vault into a hotel is kind of neat, but the quest substance consists of talking to this guy, walking back to Gamora, following Joanna, talking to her, walking back to the vault, talking to Carlitos, walking over to Freeside, talking to these guys, walking back to the Gamora, talking to Joanna, walking back to the front lobby, and waiting, walking out to Freeside, and accidentally shooting a disguised hooker in the back of the head when she runs out in front of your bullet and vats. Technical stuff aside, this whole thing is kind of stupid because apparently the Omeritas are supposedly actively hunting down Carlitos and presumably Joanna when she makes a break for it. And the big scheme here is to hide in Freeside, which is a brisk 10 second saunter from the casino. Great plan, dudes. When all is said and done, the high speech check saves the day and Joanna lets you know that the Omeritas are planning a big move against Mr. House. So my next string of tasks has me figuring out what this Kachino guy knows, which is that the upper management in the Omeritas are amassing specialists and firepower to do something or another. This involves a fella who smuggles a lot of guns into the casino, and a guy who's been hired as an explosive specialist. I uh, casually suggest to the first guy that he should go plant some thermite in the weapons cache, and so he goes and does that and gets gunned down after. Apparently I could have found some evidence of blackmail that got him to cooperate willingly, but uh, whoops, I guess. The second guy appears to be very friendly, kind of a casual observer who has no vices, which is admittedly weird for the place that he's in. After you crack into his safe, you find a holotape that depicts him raping and murdering women in visceral ways. So I tell him to get out. Again, I, I feel like I might have uh, flip-flopped the treatment of these two. I did this quest completely wrong. At the end here, the two bosses sit me down to execute me, basically, and I tell one of them that the other one had me do this stuff. So they start blasting each other, Kachino starts blasting them, everyone's blasting. I remember, I'm still on the couch. So anyways, I start blasting. I, uh, I think Gamora might be out of management options here. Maybe I get to run the casino now. These two quests kind of even out to be... Alright. The first one was pretty shitty, but I enjoyed the second one thoroughly. Plus, there's a lot of angles to go in at, which is cool. So the last of these casinos belongs to the White Glove Society, and what the fuck? Alright, this is definitely my favorite casino of all of them. It's just so different. The masks, the fact that they can see through my hidden weapons, the classical music. The place is just weird, and I like it. Except that my save got corrupted while I was gambling, which is... Great. I don't know if it's intentional, but these guys at the Ultralux are probably the most like a real-life casino that I've had to deal with. The other two casinos were cakewalks, but good lord, the amount of times that I've been kicked in the nuts by this dishonored mask-wearing dealer is insane. I eventually made out like a bandit, but god, it took a while. Minor complaint here, but for Vegas of all places as a setting, you would think there'd be a bigger abundance of games to play. It's really just roulette and blackjack. I was kind of expecting poker, maybe craps, slots, you know? Not a huge deal, but still. So the weirdness with these guys is well warranted. As it turns out, a lot of them are part of a secret society of cannibals. And they're in a bit of a bind, as their guys have basically taken the son of a super wealthy and powerful Brahmin rancher named Heck. That's a good name. They really wanted another guy who escaped and is hiding up north, surrounded by traps. And if I want to cooperate, I need to retrieve the first pick and bring Heck's son back to him. This place is, uh, fucking creepy. Starting in the dining area, this eerie bell music starts chiming in faintly in the background. When you make it to the kitchen area, there are two men torching Brahmin hides for some reason. And then when you walk further in, it's this long, tiled hallway dotted with faintly glowing red lights and lots of doors leading to god knows what. I love it. The issue is that when I go to bust 10 out as commanded by the head honcho of the White Glove Society, I get attacked. So I lock the guy out of the room and all was fine. The only two objectives I had at this point was getting Ted back to his daddy and going to see what was up with the investigator upstairs. If I go up there, I get attacked and I have no guns. And if I go outside, the quest fails. And so I decided to look it up, and apparently this quest is potentially the buggiest one in the game, according to the wiki. So that's cool. 
So when I played through this, I, I never even got the opportunity to retrieve the so-called main dish from his shack up north. I just gave Ted back to Heck and got paid, and the quest is completed. Weird. I have nothing to say to someone so lowly and ill-mannered. So we're done with the strip, but we've got two more minor factions left before we can move on with the main story. But first, a few implants. Implants take the place of bobbleheads in this game, which makes a lot more sense from a technical perspective. Basically, at 4,000 caps a pop, you can enhance every one of your special attributes, provided that you have enough endurance to handle them. Endurance is important in this game, probably more important than most others. You don't necessarily need to max it out or anything like that, but investing a few extra points into it is probably wise. In addition to the special boosts, you can also boost your damage threshold and receive a regeneration perk for 20,000 caps total. Now all that gambling I did is starting to look a lot less silly. Hell, I didn't even have enough to buy all of the implants, but I did get most of them. I'll be back for luck, but I don't think charisma is going to be on my to-do list unless I have spare change. The next faction is called the Boomers. I know, kind of a different inflection on it ten years later, huh? Well, it would have been a lot cooler if it was a bunch of old men, but surprisingly enough, it's uh, just a bunch of people who like to make shit go boom. This is told to you by a dude at the outskirts of their territory. Oh, lordy lordy. You haven't heard of the boomers? Who makes a wager with you if you can make it to the gates alive. He gave me instructions on how to dodge the incoming artillery, but I can't read. So I just went around on the train tracks. When I arrive at the front, Shifferbrains here decides that he's going to intimidate me with a launcher aimed two feet from the gate. I don't know what he thinks is going to happen when he tries to shoot that at me, but it would probably be pretty funny. Anyways, these guys' whole thing is that they're secluded on purpose to keep everyone else out of the base. But the head honcho has it in mind that if they don't let a little bit of the outside in, it'll eventually just roll over them. So now my mission is fivefold in helping these guys out and showing them that you should always trust outsiders no matter what. My first task is listening to this kiddo go on and on about the boomer's history. Basically, they were part of a vault system. Vault 34 to be exact. If you know anything about Fallout, which I assume most of you do, you'll know that many of these vaults were all separate experiments on the human race run by vault Tech. While the details aren't expanded on, it did stick out to me that every single person had a gun of some sort. It seems simple, but you have to wonder how a vault would turn out if everyone had a lethal weapon on them. Apparently, it didn't turn out too badly, as these guys struck out on their own, found the airbase, and removed the radiation from it slowly. Then they hauled howitzers over and have been trying to fix up an old B-29 bomber since then. To restore the bomber, to fly the open skies in armored safety, running high explosive ordnance upon ignorant savages. To say this self-sufficient economy of explosive-wielding nutjobs are obsessed is a bit of an understatement. The whole reason that they moved here was because they were upset with a 43-to-1 KDR. It's later revealed that the NCR tried shutting off the water from Lake Mead to their base, and uh, promptly restored it when they started getting hit with precision bombing strikes courtesy of the Boomers shortly after. So these guys are pretty feared and respected, which is kinda cool. Anyways, this lore part of the quest really just winds up with me getting rewarded for repeatedly jerking off the boomers. And I probably should have phrased that a different way considering the little boy that I'm talking to. So next I have to clear out some ants that have moved in and made a nest near the solar arrays. And they've been eating gunpowder so they explode with heat. Fortunately, I've just been using guns so no issue there. Then this guy here has been watching an actual gray alien at the Crimson Caravan Company through his binoculars. He wants me to go talk to her and see if she's interested in him, and as it turns out, she totally is. Have you spoken with McLafferty yet? That's great. I can't believe you went through all this trouble for me. Thank you. So after clearing up a few other loose ends, you meet the happy couple back at the airbase where they introduce themselves, and Janet asks if she can stay here for a while. Do you think it'll be okay if I hang around here for a little while so we can get to know each other better? Of course it would. I'll have you set up with some quarters with some of the other women. With some of the other women. With some of the other women. So I'm really about done here. You only have to do tasks for the boomers until they like you, and they idolize me at this point. Upon returning to Pearl, she commends you and asks you for your assistance with one final task. To get a B-29 bomber up from the floor of the lake. So I tell her okay and take off. 
It's not a hard task, but it is pretty cool. When you return, you're greeted as a hero and the boomers pledge themselves to your cause, letting you know that they'll be bringing in a bomber to crush your enemies when the time comes to fight at the Hoover Dam. So that leaves us with our final minor faction for this video, a very little known faction that goes by the name of the Brotherhood of Steel. The role of the Brotherhood in this game is an interesting one, or should I say their lack of a role. When I first played New Vegas way back when, I was kind of excited to see what they were up to out here, having just come off their pivotal role in Fallout 3. I was surprised and disappointed when I learned of how little their place was here in New Vegas, because they're kind of just scraping by. It's interesting because realistically speaking, the Brotherhood's role in 3 was probably much bigger than it should have been considering their West Coast origins. Sure, a small brigade of them could make sense, but they have presence like they've been in DC for an insane amount of time. So seeing the opposite side of the coin play out for them so close to the West Coast is an interesting take. So where does that leave the Brotherhood now? Well, they're holed up in a bunker, manning a very small fenced off area. When you approach their base, it's asshole central in that they seize all of your gear, fit you with an explosive collar, and tell you to go remove an NCR soldier who set up camp in another bunker close by. Doing so is an easy speech check task, and returning to McNamara has you answering him as to how you got this guy to leave, which is ridiculous because he tells you immediately after that he has a mic attached to your collar, and that he knows exactly how you got him to go. I guess he just wanted to see if you would lie? Eh. These guys are, uh, ridiculously paranoid, which is probably pretty expected due to how used to being in control they are. So McNamara here decides to send you out to retrieve the holotapes of Brotherhood patrols that have been gone too long, and in the case of them being alive, escort them back safely. This is where Paladin Harden comes in. The guy thinks that McNamara has been doing a shitty job and lacks the leadership required to make this chapter of the Brotherhood thrive. So he asks me to help him elevate himself to usurp McNamara's reign. So I tell him, yeah, sure. Uh, mostly because he asked. I'm not too fickle about who I help yet. Well, this involves a bunch of side tasks on top of my side tasks. Talking to other leadership, getting their opinions, figuring out where they stand. I wind up playing a mini game where I isolate a virus that's been jumping between servers and gain as much info as I can from the head scribe and senior paladin Ramos. Then I head off to find those missing patrols. Harden finds the fact that they have holotapes interesting, seeing as those that receive them are usually on special missions, not regular patrols like McNamara claim that they are. The entire base is on lockdown due to McNamara's decisions, and no one is allowed in or out unless cleared by him. So there is something that's happening here that needs some solving. Well, as it turns out, this goofy bastard has sent all of these guys to their deaths. So the first ones were sent to some, uh, quote-unquote, friendly mutants. The second ones were sent to the Repcon offices where they got presumably gunned down by all of the robot security. And the third ones were sent to the Boomers, which is particularly funny because the mission briefing told them that there was no way that they had any sort of firepower which could threaten a full suit of power armor. Eh, uh, whoops. So yeah, I think I'm on the side of Harden for this case. To oust McNamara, you have to do a bit of research and find a technicality within the chain of command which allows Harden to exploit it and take over. Unfortunately, there really isn't some big showdown or confrontation. It's kind of just like, all right, give me a few days. And then the screen fades out to black and there's Harden sitting there. It's kind of lame. Still, I didn't mind the rest of these quests. And when all is said and done, you can actually join the Brotherhood yourself if you complete one last mission take out an entire group of pre-war gun sellers up in Freeside. Uh, this shit is pretty tough because these guys pump out an insane amount of damage, so it took me a few tries. But eventually I was able to take them out and got to loot the store as a reward. Yeah, I still really haven't put any points into energy weapons, which kind of sucks because that's what these guys pedal, but uh, whatever. I make it back and get named a Paladin of the Brotherhood, which comes with a set of power armor. The armor is in absolutely horrendous condition, and it gives me negative agility, which sucks a lot. But I actually also got access to a safe house up north, which has a lot better gear than this, so I really can't complain too much. Plus, it has a few benches for me to create and convert ammo and create other jury-rigged shit. The Brotherhood's role in this game is very tiny compared to every other entry, really. But I think that's okay with me. I wish you the best outside brother. All right, let's finish this thing. We're off to the NCR. 
So the first thing that these guys have you doing is going to the boomers and gaining their support. Check. Next, I have to kill Pacer, the king's second-hand man, preferably without framing the NCR. I could have also used my favor from earlier to accomplish a peace between the NCR and the kings, but I decided to take those caps instead. So I decided to spike Pacer's supply of drugs. Got me. Damn. Check. Then it's off to do some real work via visiting Colonel Moore at Hoover Dam. Well, kind of. She asks me to take care of the Great Khans and the Omeritas, which I've already done. You'd think they would have given her another voice line if this were the case, something along the lines of, God damn, you a brave motherfucker. I'm glad you're on our side. Here's a gift card for TJ Maxx. You know, standard shit for getting things done ahead of time. But she still treats you like you just came back from the quest and rattles off another one instead. Well, the next one is disabling Mr. House, which, uh... Kind of regretting that upgrade I gave him earlier. I bet those boomers have some awfully big guns. Apparently it's not really a big deal though, because I can just bust through his secret area with no science check or key, which I thought was really odd. House is this ancient, decrepit human being preserved in a Dragon Ball Z Namekian recovery tube. And he tells you that he would rather die instead of simply being left to live with no control. I can't say that I blame him, though I do wonder if the, uh, sterilize option was the more humane way to go about all this. This fucking fossil could take a beating. So, with the human jerky out of the way, I think I may have stumbled upon my first real criticism of this game's story. All of these stories, no matter who you choose, intertwine in some way or another. It's something that I complimented earlier. So, for example, if I chose Yes Man, he'd want me to visit the Brotherhood and the Boomers just as the other factions would. It's all a pretty elegant way of choosing your side while still experiencing the core of what the game has to offer, along with the twist that each faction presents. Yes Man is the true middle ground here, because fighting for yourself could actually benefit these other factions as well. For example, what if I said to Caesar or the NCR leaders, hey, I have brought House's systems under my control, and I'm willing to use them to help your cause in whichever way that I can. It kind of seems like a great way to double dip between the wild card and other faction missions. But when I install Yes Man onto House's mainframe, I immediately fail all other NCR quests, or presumably Caesar's if I was working with him up until this point. I just don't see how they're mutually exclusive things. Yes, I could see how these factions would be threatened by me having all of this power, but why would they turn down all of the potential that I have outright just because I control the strip now? I imagine that they would be very interested if House suddenly said, hey, how about you uh, send over some of your soldiers onto the Strip and I help you out in your fight? I don't know, it's just the first minor thing that struck me about the story so far. After returning with my report, I get another slap to the face as my now trusted allies at the Brotherhood of Steel must be destroyed. Apparently there is no peaceful way to resolve this, which really fucking sucks. I guess there would have been if McNamara was still around, but I kind of saw to it that he wasn't, so... Basically, I have to pick three keys off of three different people and use those keys to generate a self-destruct terminal password and then hightail it out of there. Ironically, if I had five more science, I would have just been able to hack in, but oh well. I do feel bad about destroying something which I worked so hard for, but honestly, the Brotherhood are a bunch of insecure assholes in this game. I guess they kind of are in every other game, though. They just have way less power in this one and it makes them seem pathetic to be so overzealous and continue to stockpile technology while wiping out those who have stuff that they don't, while they themselves are a pretty minuscule force out here in the Mojave. Oh, and slight side note here, I do realize that Veronica's side quests are tied to the Brotherhood, and I do intend to do them alongside other notable side quests in another video. Alright, so the last phase of this never-ending quest is protecting the president of the NCR as he makes a speech. The ranger who you report to tells you that there may be something suspicious going on, so I should keep an eye out for clues and whatnot. Doing a little searching has me stumbling upon a patch of blood in the supply closet, and an engineer who tells me her friend is missing, which tells me to look around for someone in a jumpsuit. Well, there's only one guy who's wearing a jumpsuit, so I look in his pockets and there's a detonator inside. Then I happen to notice that someone left their human body on the ground outside of a sniper tower. I really hate when this happens to me, so I let the guy up top know that he might have dropped something, 
and he starts firing BB pellets at me for some reason. So I give him a tutorial on sniper rifles and sniper rifle accessories and he thanks me for the information. After this I decided that there might be more to this detonator thing and it turns out that it leads to something known as a bomb. It was kind of weighing Bear Force One down so I decided to rip it out gently. The president finishes his speech and I report back to the colonel who says, You protected our president and now the general wants to see you. This is the point of no return, as the game lets you know before you commit to this route. The Battle of Hoover Dam takes place from the dam itself all the way to Caesar's camp on the other side. It's constant battle with few pauses, and I wound up missing the part where I could flush the Legion invaders through the dam's turbines, because it was right at the start and I didn't know which arrow to follow. But I made it through these guys anyways with the help of a metric fuckton of stim packs. When I finally make it to the camp, Legate Lanius stands tall and powerful, ready to best you in combat. I instead opt to talk my way out of this like always, which much like the Master in Fallout 1 is actually a really cool way to defeat a final boss. You can either bluff him with a lie or talk strategy with him. I opted for the latter, which encompasses the idea that while they might win here, they'll also lose. A war of attrition would be both their boon and their bane as using their full might would cause them to lose everything that they fought for in the east while conquering the west. The legate recognizes this and tells you that they will retreat for now before he runs off and locks himself in his tent. This tent has fancier canvas than Bethesda promised its Fallout 76 community. And that's it for this game as far as a lot of the main stuff goes. You make your way back to the front of the camp and the general unnecessarily explodes the front gates to make a cool guy entrance. He thanks you for your work and you get to see how the end game panned out. Which for me was mostly good stuff with some not so good stuff mixed in. I particularly found it interesting that the followers were forced out of the Mojave and wound up with the great Khans in Wyoming. Who established a very prosperous and grand empire in a state that no one has ever cared about or ever will care about. Good for them. So here are my final thoughts about the game. Speech in this game is more important than I've ever seen in any other installment, and if I hadn't immediately pumped it to 80, I imagine most of my quests would have gone a lot differently. This is perfect for someone like me who's always trying to play the charismatic, charming guy in video games, which makes it ironic that charisma as a stat is god-awful and should be dropped to one immediately when starting the game, but I guess it is what it is. The amount of dialogue options in this game if you have the right stats is almost insurmountable, and I like that even having a high luck stat with some of these things meant the difference between a fight breaking out and things going smoothly. Looking back on this script, I really haven't complained about the game very much, and there really is a good reason for it. The game is great, but if I had to pick out the biggest glaring issue, it's how rushed it was, and that's by no means Obsidian's fault. I touched on this earlier, but on release, a lot of issues came packed with the game. Bugs, glitchy areas, crashing, and a lot of that hasn't been fixed even today, except by modders. And no matter how good a game is, I really don't think that that should ever be the case. No one should have to jump through hoops to play a game properly on any platform. As much as I enjoyed myself, I don't think I've ever quicksaved as much as I have in this game. I don't know. But what I will say is that Obsidian did a fantastic job making almost every single quest memorable. It really is quality over quantity and I can't help but emphatically compliment them for the job that they managed to pull off for the amount of time that they were given. I can 100% see why this game has as big of a following as it does even today. So was Fallout New Vegas as good as I remember? No. It was much better. I had a blast with almost everything, and it pains me to think that we probably won't see another iteration like this with the way that Bethesda has been handling the franchise. I hope that'll change one day. You never know. But until that day comes, I'll be using New Vegas as a benchmark for what a good RPG should be. Thanks for watching. I'm not gonna lie, the idea of this video initially intimidated the shit out of me. But I'm very glad that I did it, and I'm looking forward to covering the DLC and notable side quests. Probably not all in one video, but we'll see. And if you guys want, drop a few suggestions as to what you think some of the essential side quests are and I'll try to squeeze them in. Also, I know that a lot of you don't really like advertisements. Maybe some specific types of advertisements. And there isn't one for this video, but they really do help me out when I can get them. Many suggested that I open a Patreon and after mulling it over, I decided I'd try it out. 
Just please don't feel obligated to donate. I'm never going to twist your arm on this. Anyways, I've got a Twitch where I fit in streams when I've got time. I got a Twitter where I talk about stuff. And I have a Discord where people chill out and shoot the shit in the meantime. And that's it. Have a good one.